Sometimes it's good to just be still and feel this beautiful presence and have a heart of gratitude for what he did for us. I was flying home in the plane from Missouri this week, and as I was looking at all those clouds, it just felt like you could just open the window and step out on those clouds, and one day we will. One day we're going to hear that trumpet sound, and this is not a fairy tale. This is not a story. This is reality, folks. Just like that cloud is a reality, Jesus is going to give the command and have them sound the trumpet. And then he's going to step out onto those clouds and meet us in the air in those clouds. And as I look at those clouds out of the plane, it's like, oh Lord, one day I will step on these clouds and you will be there and your angels will be there. And all my loved ones will come out of the grave that have gone on before and will meet them in the air. Whoa, what a meeting. What a meeting. And as I was praying and asking the Lord for a message, the Lord spoke to me about faithfulness. Now, I know on Wednesday, I, when God told me faithfulness, I, I know Wednesday that at Bible study, my sister taught on faithfulness. I hope you all had a wonderful time there. And we learned about the faithfulness of God. And most of the time when someone mentions faithfulness, right away our minds go to God, how faithful he is, how steadfast he is, how we know we can trust him, how he never loses his love for us, that his mercy is new every morning, great is thy faithfulness, Lord. But today I want to talk about our faithfulness to God, because we know he's faithful to us. But do you know that there is a great reward waiting for you for your faithfulness to God. I look around and I see those in our congregation, how faithful you are to God. How you are determined to follow Christ. Amen? And that touches my heart. I so enjoy our Wednesday night Bible studies where we can talk to one another and share our hearts and get to know one another and learn God's word. And if you are able to come out, we would love to see you at our Bible studies. So turn with me now to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Starting with verse 5. And Paul is speaking to Timothy and he says this, But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. I want to talk to the Holy Spirit and to God and to Jesus for just a moment. Father, I thank you for your word. And I know, Father, that without you, without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit, I can do nothing this morning. I want only to say what you want me to say, Lord. So lead me and guide me. Your word comes alive. It's a live word written to us, Lord. Let it nourish us. Let it encourage us. Because your faithfulness to us is so wonderful and so great. I need your anointing, Lord, and I thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 
Paul was speaking to Timothy and he says, watch in all things. We need to be diligent and we need to keep our spiritual eyes open as well as our physical eyes to what's going on in the world today. I was sitting next to someone in the plane on the way home and we were looking out the window, he and I, and we got along really good. He was a probation officer from the state of New Hampshire and I was talking to him about how I counseled domestic violence and worked in the court system as a victim's advocate. So we hit it off really good. But as we were looking out and looking at the clouds, I was showing him where Charlotte was as we were coming in because he had never been to Charlotte. And I said to him, when you look at the whole earth, because you can see the curve of the earth, how can anyone not know that there's a God that loves us? But God tells us to watch. Watch and be aware of what's going on in the world today. Watch and be aware of what's going on in your own spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ today. Because the devil knows it's so easy to entice the human race and draw us away from Christ. So we must watch in all things. Amen? And then Paul tells Timothy, endure affliction. Accepting Jesus Christ brings affliction. Jesus tells us to count the cost before we accept him because there is affliction, there is heartache, there is rejection. What they did with Jesus, how they treated him is how they'll treat you if you truly are a believer. Amen? Do the work of an evangelist. You know, we are all called to be evangelists. What is an evangelist? That's someone who goes to others and proclaims the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we don't have to remain in our sin, that we don't have to die eternally, that we can live forever. The good news that Jesus came. We're all to proclaim that good news. Hallelujah. And make full proof of your ministry. I like that right there because we are all called to minister. In some capacity, you have a calling on your life to minister if you are a born again believer. I like to say there's no big eyes and little U's in heaven. God has foreordained each one of us what he wants us to do and how he wants us to serve why? So we can just be servants to him? No, because he has a reward for us in heaven. He wants to bless us. If we're faithful to him, as he's been faithful to us, he will bless us. And there's a great reward waiting for those who are faithful to him. Your labor is not in vain, the Bible says. Everything you do, God sees. Every word you speak to someone that may not know Jesus Christ, God sees. Every time you're on your knees praying for someone's salvation or someone's healing or someone's deliverance, God sees and there's a great reward for that. Every time you lift someone up by your conversation and encourage that's what God is pleased with and he sees it and there's a great reward for your faithfulness to him. Amen? Well, Paul says in verse 7 Oh, let's go to verse 6. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here. Paul says, for I am now ready to be offered. He knew that he was about to die. And the time of my departure is at hand. He knew he was about to die. He was in prison. God had showed him his ordained time was at hand. Each one of us 
have an ordained time to depart this world. Each one of us is going to fly away. And you will determine by your decision if you will spend eternity in joy and bliss and peace with Jesus Christ. Where there are rewards that eye has not seen, neither has the ear ever heard or could enter into our mind the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And when you think of what he's done for us, how could we not love him? We just finished having communion. But it's not just about the physical suffering that Jesus suffered on that cross. He carried your sin today. He carried the reproach of everything you've ever done wrong on his body when he was holy and never had sinned in his life. He took on your sin and carried it. He carried your shame so that you could be free, so that you could live eternally with him. Each one of us has an appointment on God's calendar. God knows the day of your appointment. When you will leave this body and your spirit and soul will either enter into heaven if you've accepted Jesus Christ or if you've chose to push him away from your life, you'll end up in a place where you're separated from him. The Bible calls it Sheol or hell. But God doesn't want that for you. I don't want that for you. That's why I'll stand up here until the day Jesus calls me home and preach the good news that God loves you. And that's not what he made you for. Not for you to perish. Not for you to, to die eternally. God loves you. And he sent his only, his one and only son to leave heaven, to leave the worship of the angels, to leave the joy unspeakable and come to this fallen earth and lay down his life so that you can go to be with him one day. He came to you so you can go to be with him. Why would you choose to do anything else? Why would you choose to be separated? Folks, there's nothing on this earth that will give you satisfaction. There's nothing that you're enjoying right now if you're a sinner that will last. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to push God out of your life when all he has is good intentions for you. So Paul says, I'm now ready. He was waiting. He was excited, though. He knew he was about to die, and he knew he was about to be uh, beheaded there. I'm sure his natural man was concerned, but his spiritual man was saying, it won't be long, and I'll be seeing him again. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Being a Christian means to fight. Some people like to say, well, Christians uh, believing in God and all that, you're a wuss. You do that as a crutch because you're not strong enough on your own. You just got to turn to a God that can do things for you. Let me tell you, when you become a Christian, that's when you learn how to fight because the whole world is coming against you. The river is flowing in the opposite direction from the world coming at you and you're going opposed to everything of the world. You're opposed to the world systems. You're opposed to sin. You're opposed to the devil. You're opposed to abortion. You're opposed to the thing that hurt and kill and destroy. And don't think that there won't be a fight our opposition. But God says we don't fight in the physical realm. He didn't call us to punch each other out. He didn't call us to, uh, on abortion lines where we're protesting. 
testing, to get into physical confrontation. That's a reproach to God. God didn't tell you to physically confront anybody. God told us how to fight in the spiritual realm. He told us in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the whole armor of God that she may be able to withstand the tricks of the devil and the enemy. It's a spiritual warfare that we're fighting. And guess what? We win. Because he won for us. But I love this part that Paul says. He says, I kept the faith. That means he held on tightly to his faith, even though he had to endure affliction. He refused to let go of his faith, even though he was beaten and whipped and stoned and left for dead. He kept the faith. He held tightly to it. He endured no matter what. You know, we as humans, we keep things that mean something special to us, right? The things that we cherish, we keep. I remember years ago, and maybe some still have hope chests. How many have ever seen a hope chest? What's a hope chest? It's where a woman will take the things that she cherishes, maybe her bridal uh, dress from her wedding, or things that her children have given her, but the things that we cherish, we put them there in that hope chest. When it came time for me to move, and I've moved now 68 or 69 times in my life, folks, so now I'm planted. I thank the Lord for helping me and building a home for me two miles down from the church, and I'm singing that song, I shall not be moved. But when I moved, I always would go through the things that I had and decipher what I cherish and what I could let go of. What I wanted to bring with me and what I could sell. And most of it I sold, but there were things that my children had made and things that others had given me that meant something to me. And I wouldn't let go of them. No matter how many times I moved, they'd come with me. That's the kind of faith that Paul had. He wouldn't let go of it. He cherished the faith that he had. It was valuable to him what Jesus Christ had done for him. He never would forget when he was on the road to Damascus, on the way to kill Christians, thinking he had it all together, thinking he was doing God a service. He'll never forget the day that light shone from heaven and Jesus spoke to him and appeared to him. And when God touches your life, you'll never be the same. Some people say, well, there's many, many religions and people are active in all of them and there might be many ways to get to heaven. No, folks. There's only one way to get to heaven. There's only one person that was holy enough to take your sin upon them, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the way, he is the absolute truth, and he is the life today. There is no other religion that can take away your sin. There is no other religion, no matter who they've got, that they like to worship and lift up. Whether it's Buddha, no matter, doesn't matter what it is. Buddha didn't die for you. Muhammad didn't die for you. He was a sinner just like you. He couldn't. He couldn't take away your sin. There is only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. And we must hold to it tightly. We must be faithful to God because he's been faithful to us. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. God promised us eternal life. God promised us a life in heaven and a life here reigning and ruling with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will come back to earth and reign and rule and put everything back in order the way it should have been before
for sin came and destroyed everything. You see, the pleasures of this world only last for a short time. They only last for a short time. And eternity is forever and ever and ever. So we must hold fast. Keep it. Like Paul said, I kept the faith. I keep it. I hold it fast. The profession of our faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I personally am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Years ago, I stood downtown in North Carolina, Charlotte, in front of the Bank of America, singing and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone that walked by. And I'm not ashamed of what Jesus did for me. I'm not ashamed that he came and he touched my life. I'm not ashamed that he came and he audibly spoke to me and told me that he was with me. I'll never doubt God again because he's real. Amen? In James, G James says to us, blessed is the man that endures temptation. So what is faithful? Faithful. Well, we use that terminology in a lot of things. If something's hurt, Full, it means it's full of hurt. If something's awful, it's full of like awe of how terrible it is. Awful. To be faithful to Christ is to be full of faith in Him. And faithfulness will always lead to actions in your life. You can't be faithful to God and full of faith and it not come out of your life. There'll be actions that line up with his word. You'll be faithful to his word. You'll be faithful to read his word. You'll be faithful to meditate on his word. You'll be faithful to talk to him. You'll be so full of faith, knowing and knowing and knowing that what he says is true because he's faithful to what he's promised. Amen? So I ask myself this question, and maybe today you ask yourself this question, what is God asking me to do? And am I faithful to him? Am I really, really being faithful to him? Do my actions show by going to church? Do my actions show by tithing? Do my actions show by prayer and worship? The Bible says that the faithful worship him in Psalms. So what is God asking me to do to be faithful? Well, the first thing God asks us to do, Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That encompasses everything. Your heart, your soul, and your mind. Some might love God but have trouble with their mind. And they need to rededicate and ask the Holy Spirit to work in their mind and give them the mind of Christ. And we receive from the Word what Jesus thinks and what God thinks. That's why when we read the Word, we get to learn about God. And so we then can reflect by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we know what's right and we know what's wrong. So God's first asking us to love him. Now you might say, I'm not sure whether I've been faithful to God. And maybe your mind right away goes to works. I'm not 
sure that I've done anything for God. I'm not sure what he's asking me to do, so how can I do it if I'm not sure? So many might say, God, I don't know where you called me. I don't know what you want me to do. I'm not sure I'm called to preach. I don't really go out and evangelize much, but I'll talk to relatives and friends about you, but that isn't getting out there and evangelizing. God, I'm not sure what you want me to do today. And the Lord is so, <laughs> he looks at you and he says, I called you to do one thing, and that's to love me. You can do that. Just think about how much I love you and everything I've done for you and how I gave you my son and how I want you with me and how I'm willing to wash away your sin and forget them. As far as the east is from the west, remember them no more. That's all I'm asking you to do, to love me, and the rest will fall in place. Amen? And then Jesus tells us something else. How can we know if we're faithful? Well, if we're loving God, our actions will show it. But then Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means a heart that loves God so much that you want to do what's right. You know you're not saved by your works. You can never get to heaven by your works. That's not why Christians should be doing works. We're not earning brownie points to make it into heaven. We're doing works because we love him. And he loved us. And it's the least that we can do for what he's done for us. We're seeking first his kingdom and doing what's right in our lives. You want to know how much somebody loves God? Just look at their actions. The ones that are pushing away what they know is wrong and praying and saying, Lord, deliver me from what I know is not right in my life. That's a pure heart. That's a heart that loves God. That's a heart that's not content to stay in bondage in the world, but wants to come out of bondage. Are we a work in progress? Oh, yes, we are. None of us have arrived. If you've arrived, stand to your feet. But I don't think anybody's going to stand up here. And I certainly know I haven't arrived. It's only by the grace of God I am what I am. It's only by the anointing of God that I can give you his word today. In myself of nothing. But if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you know something happens to you when you give your heart to Jesus Christ. All of a sudden things look so different. You never saw them that way. There actually is a new birth that goes on in your life, a spiritual birth, where things that you thought were okay and things that you were doing that you just thought, oh, well, it's all right. You all of a sudden look at them and say, no, I don't want to do that. There's a change in you. Born again, there's really been a change in me. Born again, just like Jesus said. You no longer want to sin. It's not like some have been misled by the devil that I accept Jesus Christ and then all the things that I like to do, I'm going to have to stop doing. I can't drink anymore. I can't cuss anymore. I can't go out down the bar and have a lot of fun with my friends anymore. I just don't think I want this Jesus thing in my life. It'll take away all my fun. That's not the way it is. You see, your fun has a timetable and it's going to end anyway. And those that accept Jesus Christ, their mind is renewed. They have a changing within them. It's a super spiritual thing, a miraculous thing that changes you like you've got blinders coming off your eyes and you see how useless the things you're doing are and where they're leading you is not where you really want to go. I don't know of any Christian after they've had a real experience with Jesus Christ that 
would say I'd love to go back and do the things that I was doing. Most of them fight against it in the spirit because they know they lead nowhere. They're useless. They're dead works. But thank God he does a change within us. Thank God he changes our thinking, changes our desires, changes our understanding. And he gives us a new vision. Things aren't blurry anymore. I can see clearly now, as that song is, as it goes. I can see clearly now. When you accept Jesus Christ, something really happens within you. Not only in the natural, physical realm is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but there is an inward change where you desire to walk righteously. You love righteousness and you love God for all the wonderful things he's prepared for you and for giving you his one and only son. Well, there's one other thing that would show us in our lives if we're examining our own lives. Lord, what is it you're asking me to do? How do I know if I'm full of faith? How do I know if I'm faithful? Because there's sometimes I ask you for things and I know I just don't have the faith to believe you'll do them. And I, I want to have the faith to believe it, but Lord, there's times I don't feel full of faith. When crisis comes and circumstances look far from turning around to what I wish they would be, sometimes I struggle in doubt and sometimes I don't feel faithful. And we see in the Bible that even others felt that same way. One man said, Lord, help thou my unbelief. Jesus tells us in John 15, turn with me to John 15. In John 15, Jesus tells us another way to be faithful. Something else that God would have us to do after we've accepted him and experienced salvation, to let our faith grow, to be full of faith, because again, there's a great reward for your faithfulness. In John chapter 15, it says, I am the true vine. Jesus always emphasizes that. I'm the true light in 1 John 1, 9. I am the true vine in John 15. And my father is the husbandman. And the husbandman man is one who tends to the vines. One who watches out and nourishes the vine. And every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. Now to purge means to prune. And when you go to prune things, and I know some of you sit in here garden a lot. When you go to prune something, you cut off not only the dead parts, but the living parts that are going way out of kilter. I know I got a vine on my front porch. It's so pretty with the red flowers, but when I bought it, I didn't realize it was a vine, and all the vines are starting to grow, and they're going to go across the front where people want to enter. So I go out and I regularly cut it back. Well, God sometimes has to cut back things in our life to get out of kilter. Sometimes we grab a hold of something that we never saw before in the Word, and then we get off balance with it. God is a God of balance. We see that even in the church today. People don't want to praise the Lord, don't want to shout, don't want to run the aisles. They're so afraid they'll get off balance. And so they don't do it, so now they won't balance the other way. But when Jesus touches your heart and you're feeling his presence, you can't help but shout. But God says he'll cut off the dead parts 
as well as the things that are off balance. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. That's what God is asking from us, to love him with all our heart, to seek first his kingdom, and to abide in Jesus. To abide means to remain in, to keep him ever before you and in your heart, like Paul said, I've kept the faith. I believe in Jesus. I keep him in my heart. And Jesus says, abide in me. Keep me in your life. Continually do the things in your heart that show forth that I live within you. Amen. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You can't bear fruit. So there is a reward for your faithfulness and faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. But Galatians 5.22 tells us this fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, and faith. It's a fruit. But you can't bear this fruit of faith unless you abide in him. He says, abide in me, and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. In other words, all the nourishment that you get in your life comes from me that's within you. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Amen? I'm going to turn back to Timothy really quick. In Timothy chapter 6. Verse 12, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. And that's what God has called us to do. Love him. Commit ourselves to him. Seek first his kingdom and abide in him. And I'm going to close with this last verse found in James. James 1, 12 says, blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. That is the reward. The crown of life. If you keep your faith. If you abide in him. If you love him and seek first his kingdom. There's a crown waiting for you. You see some will get into heaven but there will be no rewards. Because they've accepted Jesus Christ. But they haven't sought first the kingdom. They're not abiding in him to the full degree that God asks us to remain and fellowship with him. Lastly, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul again says, I fought for the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. James talks about the crown of life. Paul speaks of the crown of righteousness and doing what is right. There's more than one crown when we get to heaven. There's a great reward for your faithfulness, your dedication to preach the gospel, to speak God's word to others, to try to woo others to the cross so that they will know that they can have life eternal and don't have to be separated from Christ or from God. There's wait for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, Paul says, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Do you cherish him today? Do you love him today? Are you longing for his appearance? Where sin will no longer be in the world, when Jesus comes back to reign and to rule, and his father, after the thousand year reign, all sin will be put down, and God himself, the father, will come and join with us, 
And that's when all the tears will be wiped away. And that's when sin will be no more. And that's when God will judge and see those that were left on earth during the thousand year reign who wants to continue and abide in Christ and love him. For he loves us with a love that's so great, a love beyond anything we can fathom. So I wanted to encourage you today in the Lord. Keep being faithful is a great reward. Keep loving him. That's the first thing he wants you to do. Until he calls you to serve him in a different capacity, the greatest thing he's called you to do is to love him with all your heart. And if you're loving him, that's all you need to do. Amen. It says that you're faithful when you love him. We don't want to get into looking at our works as our qualifications for going to heaven. No, our works will not. Jesus said, abide in me, for without me you can do nothing. You can't save yourself. You can't deliver yourself. You can't make your sin go away on your own. The only reason why a Christian wants to do works should be because of the gratitude they have in their heart. Amen. Let's just stand to our feet. Maybe today if someone's listening and they've never made that choice to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, maybe you're doing a whole bunch of things that you know in your heart aren't right and they're going to lead to a dead end. Why would you choose why would you choose a life that only is going to hurt you and lead you to a dead end? Oh, it may be fun for a while, but it's time to turn around. Turn around because Jesus is coming very soon. And it'll be too late. It'll be too late if you don't accept him before the appointment of your death and you don't know when that is. If you're listening today, say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Change me, like Pastor Patricia said, where I don't enjoy sin. I don't enjoy the things that will be harmful to me in the long run. Change me that I might see the beauty of your love for me, your forgiveness. Change me and take away my shame and my reproach. If you pray that prayer, God will write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And for those of us that have prayed that prayer that are standing here this morning, I want to encourage you that God sees your faithfulness. God sees your love. God sees the times that you've shared your testimony and the wonderful healings that he's given you, and the way he heard you when you cried out to him many years ago to fill a void that you had in your life. God sees your faithfulness. Let's keep on going. Let's hold on to our faith and cherish what God has given us. Amen? Now, Father, go with us today. As we're on the highways, Lord, surround us with your angels and keep us safe. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your love. I thank you, Lord, that there is a great reward for those of us who have surrendered to you. Lord, help us to fight the good fight. Help us to lay hold on eternal life. Help us to keep going in faith, Lord, and to remain faithful to you by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We give you glory and honor today, Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you all, and I'll see you Wednesday night. Amen? Amen. Amen.